So good good morning, good afternoon, everyone. I am Carlo Pietrobelli. I'm the UNESCO chair at the United Nations University, uh, UNU Merit in Maastricht. And, and we're beginning with uh, our first uh, webinar of a series of webinar. Uh, last year, we had uh, distinguished speakers. And today, we're beginning uh, having a, a, a very well-known professor from Columbia University, Tom Morenhout. That will be followed by uh, our colleague, uh, uh, Jorge Valverde. Uh, let me just say uh, a few words on the topic of today. Uh, we're going to hear uh, from Tom about the critical mineral supply chain fundamentals throughout the changing geopolitical landscape. And, uh, and this is a very hot topic. This is something that uh, is of relevance for development economists that have been discussing for, for decades about the role of natural resources and development, never agreeing whether it's, it's a curse or it's an opportunity for for development, but it's also a topic that has become hot with the digital and green transitions that require a lot of new minerals, a lot of previously unknown or underutilized minerals that have become critical. And the criticality of these uh, minerals uh, is uh, different depending on the perspective that one uh, adopts. So uh, advanced countries, as well as more developing and emerging countries are adopting different strategies to make uh, the most out of this uh, critical mineral. So I'm very happy to, to welcome uh, Tom Murnhut. Tom is a, is a professor at Columbia University, uh, specifically at the Columbia University School of International Public Affairs. And he leads the Critical Materials Initiative uh, at the prestigious Columbia Centers on Global Energy Policy. Tom has been an advisor uh, at the World Bank, at the United States government, at the OECD. He held position, visiting positions at uh, uh, New York University, as well as uh, Sciences Po in, in Paris. And he's a well-known expert on critical minerals. So I'll, I'll, I'll give him the floor. And uh, this will be followed by Jorge Valverde uh, later. Thank, Tom, welcome. And the floor is yours. Super. Uh, thank you, Carlo. Thank you for uh, inviting me. I'm very happy to... Uh, to be speaking with you all about uh, critical mineral supply chain. I present, I prepared the deck, so I'll, I'll quickly share it. We can run through it, but I definitely encourage everybody, if you have um, a question, um, feel free to to unmute. I think there's a Q&A at the end as well, um, but, but don't hesitate, I would say, right? Um, so I don't want to patronize anybody, but in my, uh, <laughs> that's a good way to start, a, uh, to start a presentation. But in my experience, there's actually still quite a lot of, of sort of um, issues that are unknown. And, and in my experience, it also includes with, 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 with government and with policymakers. So maybe very quickly, if, if very few introductory concepts before we get into uh, politicals, what are minerals? I'll, I'll skip over that. It's of course the um, the, the periodic table of, uh, of the elements of which we currently use about 40% um, of known elements to us in energy transition technologies. So, so close to half of this table is going into, into energy. So fundamentally different, obviously, from, um, from fossil fuels, where one uh, particular fuel, one particular uh, resource can be uh, sufficient to actually power something. This is obviously not the case for, for minerals. You need to combine a bunch of those um, into sort of electrochemical reactions before they do um, their magic. Another thing that is uh, quite important to note and, and um, that, that some people don't, don't fully realize is that some of those min minerals you can't just mine, right? They actually, they occur more as byproducts of, of other minerals. And, and this is something that, that I like to, to use to show that. It's what we call sort of the, the wheel of companionality, if you wish. Um, which kind of shows you some of these base metals, the one that we do mine exclusively, right? Nickel, copper, zinc, lead, and so forth. And then here you have uh, some minerals that basically occur as a byproduct of that uh, of that mining, right? So um, cadmium here um, is, is a good one. It's, it's produced more. So when you're in that inner circle, it's basically um, more than 75% uh, of global production is oops is as the byproduct of of a mineral right i like i like to point to this one gallium if you remember gallium is is very important for semiconductors 
last um, last year uh, alone, well, last year, a couple of months ago, China imposed uh, sort of export restrictions or export controls on um, on gallium. And that was a big problem for the semiconductor industry. And so people sometimes come up with this idea, well, then we need to go and find gallium deposits. That's actually not how it works. Most of the gallium uh, in the world, so close to 90% of gallium, does not come from their own deposit. They're actually uh, you know, produced as a byproduct of aluminum smelting. Right, and these type of things are 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 important because they do determine a little bit the, the compungenality. And here, this is another way of showing the exact same point uh, again in that table of contents, where if you are red um, or sort of dark red, it's more than eighty or more than ninety percent of your production is as a byproduct, right? And some of these are critical minerals um, for the energy transition, and and this matters because it means that um, countries with existing capacity. Um, both in terms of mineral processing and the extraction of it, um, immediately actually have a sort of comparative advantage in a number of other critical minerals, right? Uh, and the best example here, of course, is, is, is China. And we'll be talking a lot about China since they are uh, currently the dominant player in these uh, supply chains, right? Um, again, very quick 101, I think that is an important difference to make as well. Of course, you all know what exploration and extraction is. Um, processing is also important, right? Processing is basically what, what uh, refining crude oil into petroleum is for minerals. And what this processing is, is, is purely purification. When you get a rock out of the ground with critical minerals, there's a lot of stuff you don't need, right? If you get copper, copper out of the ground, you're lucky if what you get out of the ground has 2% copper, right? If that's the ore grade, you're lucky. Most of the time it's less. And processing basically means getting rid of everything that you're not interested in to end up with something that is 99.99% that mineral, right? So just really cleaning it. And that is a combination of um, sort of more... Uh, lower know-how mechanical issues like crushing and grinding and everything you can imagine, all the way to, uh, of course, smelting, right, where you use uh, sort of temperature and, and water processes to clean that mineral. And at the very end, it's actually quite high-tech electrical stuff as well. So, so not the first part of when you start cleaning such a mineral and the last part are quite different in, in what they do, right? Um, the relevance for the energy transition, I think you all know that by now, that's kind of the point I just wanted to make. We're using more and more of those. Um, uh, it's a big list. Uh, this is what Carlo was just saying in his, in his introduction. This is the list of the United States. I had to zoom out four times before I could capture it on, on one single screen, but they're quite different across different countries um, indeed. And this is the one that I guess uh, some of you might might already be aware of, right? This is why we're very interested in it. If you compare an electric vehicle and a conventional internal combustion engine, um, there's just so many more minerals uh, in uh, an electric vehicle, right? Same thing on the power generation side. When you look at wind and solar PV, they're much more mineral intensive than coal or natural gas fired power plants, right? Um, is that a bad thing? Not necessarily, that is just how the technology works, right? Does that mean that we're going to need to destroy all biodiversity on Earth to get to those minerals? Personally, I think that's also a statement that is a little bit exaggerated, right? Whenever you mine, you harm the environment. This is true, and there are ways to do that more responsibly, and we need to look at that. But the volume that you need of critical minerals compared to the volume that you need of fossil fuels is actually much lower, right? So, so the big challenge for critical minerals is that we'll need new mines, right? And so, and so that's where the whole sort of social and environmental uh, responsibility comes in. And I think it's a very good uh, conversation to have. It's a necessary one to have, um, but it doesn't mean that we're going to need to mine every single piece of pristine land on earth, not, not at all, right? Um, these are some of the growth rates, uh, very pronounced for two minerals specifically, lithium and copper, right? Um, if you look at lithium, we will need to, I mean, the, the growth rate by 2050 um, is really is really substantial. It's basically 12 times more than what we're doing right now. That means, of course, a lot of new lithium mines are needed, right? And again, that responsible sourcing element becomes so uh, important. The second one is copper, right? Copper is at the center of everything. You can't do anything um, electrical in a small space without using copper. 
right? We can substitute it for some stuff, but if you want the highest performance, uh, the highest performance corrosion resistance, and and the sort of the yeah the, the just the best productive performance as well, it's copper. So our energy transition technologies, that's why many of them use copper, right? If you think about transmission lines, you know those long lines of electricity that you see when. Uh, when you're driving with the car. That's actually something that we can slowly move towards aluminium. We've been quite good at that um, because space is not a constraint, right? Um, whenever you get into a building, into an appliance, into an electric vehicle, into a wind turbine, it needs to be copper because you don't have uh, the space, right? And then some of the other ones, the growth rates are, um, are quite significant as well. Um, this is another way to, to look at it, but I'll, I'll skip that. So in terms, of, um, in terms of why we care so much about these critical minerals, this is a, a quite important graph. Um, this is basically what you see here is what recycling will be able to provide in terms of mineral supply, um, the percentage here of mineral demand, that's a better way to put it, the percentage of mineral demand that we can cover by recycling, right? And the, the beautiful thing in a way about critical minerals is, and that's how it's so fundamentally different from oil, gas and coal is, they are infinitely recyclable, right? Once we take them out of the ground, we can reprocess them, right? So yes, we are going to do harm, but once you have that, that doesn't need to end up uh, on a landfill or it isn't combusted, right? It's infinitely recyclable. And that is interesting, but it's interesting more in the medium term. Some people are expecting that by 2030, we can start covering a lot of our mineral demand um, by recycling, right? And, and that's when it really will start taking off, right? But it's towards mid-century and definitely 2060 that we see the need for mining really reduce, right? Really substantially um, reduce. Um, and that is, of course, because our energy transition just requires so much deployment of those clean energy technologies, right? And so we'll need to do some form of, of virgin mining, raw material mining, um, before we get to that level where we can be really circular, right? Now, uh, there's one thing that, that gives me a lot of hope is the recycling part uh, on the battery side of things, right? I'm not saying in for every clean energy technology, but on the battery side of things um, is a sector I would be very bullish in. We see a lot of R&D, we see costs being driven down, um, even for applications that we thought beforehand or like a couple of years ago, these are not going to be competitive uh, to, to be recycled, right? And we're actually seeing that improving year on year. And we see a huge sort of R&D and innovation battle going on, if you wish, between um, the US, Europe, China, and so forth. So everybody is developing um, indigenous recycling capacity. Even India, even other countries are looking at that as well. And so that is quite a, a, very, positive, um, a very positive trend. Why do we care about that again? Obviously, for, if you're a government, you also care about, about these statistics, right? What are your most valuable sectors? Automaking, super important, big employer uh, in, in many countries, whether it's, again, India or, or the US or Europe. Um, and what we're seeing today, of course, is that uh, within uh, automobiles, uh, the automotive industry, electric vehicle is, is, is the, the sunrise industry, right? And if you miss out com uh, competitiveness today, it's going to be diff more and more difficult to get back your, your market share. So a lot of uh, companies feel they need to move into that very aggressively, very quickly um, today, or they will be outcompeted. And we'll talk a little bit more um, about that uh, later, later on. Um, Here's your market potential. I think this is something that people might have, have read about. So BYD here is the that, that, that sort of light blue line. This is a Chinese uh, EV maker, right? And so their rise has been absolutely huge um, in terms of in terms of market cap. And when you look at all of your more conventional producers, including Tesla, by the way, their market share is actually going backwards, right? So so we really have. Uh, a global competition unfolding at the automotive level, not just at the um, at the critical minerals level, um, with China uh, basically having the ability to outcompete all of us. And and currently, what we're seeing is reaction uh, from governments 
to that reality, right? And and just today, you might have you might have seen um, in the news already the Biden administration announced uh, that they increased the tariffs of electric vehicles uh, coming from China from twenty five percent to one hundred percent. Uh, and tariffs on batteries and critical minerals will be pulled up to 25%, right? It's a very complex reality because on the one hand, you of course have to acknowledge these sectors are strategic, again, specifically the automotive sector. It makes sense that the US administration needs to do something to make sure that their sectors are not fully outcompeted, right? On the other hand, with these tariffs, you are increasing costs on consumers. You are slowing down the energy transition compared to what our global capacity is to actually implement that, that energy transition. And this is obviously where geopolitics start coming in. Um, and in most cases, I would say the geopolitical geopolitical outlay uh, right now is is uh, restricting our energy transition rather than uh, than than turbocharging it, right? This is also why we care about those minerals. So you don't need to look at all of this, but maybe that little green figure here, this is a quite well-known one. Um, why we care about critical minerals? Very simple, because a lot of the technologies that, we, uh, that we're using for uh, the energy transition and that we will be using in that next decade, and that next decade, I cannot stress enough how important that decade is going to be. Um, again, only a few days ago, climate scientists again rang the alarm bell on, on the fact that uh, our carbon emission concentration in the atmosphere is, is increasing much faster than they had anticipated, right? Um, so that next decade, we're going to need to install a lot of the technologies that we have today, right? There are other ones under development, of course, and we will see where they go. Uh, green hydrogen uh, will be important probably one day, right? Um, small scale modular, modular nuclear uh, reactors, maybe, you know, this is at the beginning of the cost curve of, of, of technology development. We don't know anything about that, about that yet. We need to see where that goes. But in the next 10 years, we're going to be using the technologies that we have, solar PV, wind, um, and lithium ion batteries specifically. And then it's good to look at, so where are we with respect to those technologies, right? And where we are is that we have done a really good job in learning by doing. So we have used those technologies so much now, we installed them so much that, and that I like that green line for, um, that you see those costs just coming down very strongly, right? And that the fact that this stagnates is not necessarily a bad thing. This is what any mature technology will do, right? Um, you will put in a lot of money on deployment, the, the, the cost reductions, will accelerate, will be fast. And then as the technology matures, those technolo those cost reductions, you know, become less, right? Now, when those, start, uh, when those cost reductions become less and the technology becomes more mature, the cost of the materials that go into those technologies, of course, becomes more important, right? And in this case, this is uh, the cost of, of minerals. And this is, again, if you look at uh, the historical graph for uh, lithium ion batteries, what you see here in 2000, uh, you know, basically 2023, you saw that prices actually went up, right? Sorry, 2022. You saw that prices actually went up of lithium ion batteries, right? So you have those reductions and at one point they went up. And this, the fact that those prices went up was related to or was directly caused by the increase in, um, in material costs, right? Specifically of lithium, but also of nickel. In 2003, the prices crashed and the battery costs went down very strongly, right? So what we're noticing now is that the cost of our clean energy technologies is, is, is fundamentally linked to um, the cost of, of, of these critical minerals, right? And that's, of course, why we, need to, um, why we need to care for that quite substantially. Some of the challenges for uh, supply chains, uh, because I think it's important to highlight that, um, so that, that we all sort of have a, a common understanding, right? The first one is that investment needs are, are, are quite gigantic, right? Um, that is specifically nickel and copper, um, because copper, of course, is, 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 a, is a fundamentally different uh, industry than, than, say, lithium or cobalt. What these percentages hide, I think, is how challenging it can be um, to get the amount of lithium that we need, remember? 
what I shown before, the, the growth rates in for our demand are actually the highest for lithium, right? And when you look at that, you say, well, okay, but it doesn't cost that much. Well, the point here is not necessarily about the, the cost alone. It's also about uh, the permitting, the geopolitical challenges, uh, the challenges related to environmental and social um, responsibility as well. Right? These can uh, hamper projects, and so we urgently need to look into that. And these um, these ESG challenges are are real, of course, right? I mean, I think child labor in the DRC is the best known um, uh, example. Of course, that child labor specifically happens in artis artisanally mined um, cobalt. That is about a quarter of the production of the DRC. Uh, the DRC is about 70% of global production and batteries using cobalt are about half of global batteries. So there are tons of batteries that don't have this type of cobalt in it, um, but it did uh, really impact investment into the industry. Same thing what you see here. This is where, uh, you know, tailings from a, a mining site um, get into nature. Uh, we've seen some of those tailing dam collapses in the past um, and they really affect uh, obviously local people and, and local environment, but also the investment appetite. Um, and that makes sense. Um, and we are now in a situation where basically for about a decade, up until two years ago, we underinvested in exploration, we underinvested in production, we underinvested in, in, in delivering methods that are that are cleaner, right? And so that is now coming up again, um, but we have lost sort of a decade there, right? Um, and this is challenging because of the amount of time uh, it takes to develop a mine, right? So again, if you see that in the next decade, decade and a half, we're going to need to be installing a whole lot of um, a whole lot of critical minerals, a whole lot of uh, technologies. Um, we're going to need more mines, but these are some uh, sort of the, the the average lead times, if you want, between a decision on 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 exploration and investment and first production. And for many mines, we've seen that as well over a decade. And so that immediately shows that we just have a time constraint that we need to deal with, right? And, and that's a, a very complicated um, factor. This is another way to uh, to look at that, right? Discovery, exploration, pre-feasibility studies, feasibility to production and so forth. But so really we, we quite easily hit um, uh, a decade of time before one of those mines opens. And so we need to, we need to work on, on that as well. This I'm going to skip for now. Um, then I wanted to get into sort of the, the geopolitical uh, component of this as well. Um, this I can just more easily show here. Um, the, the biggest uh, problem geopolitics wise is that we have what is called choke points, geographic choke points, um, which are where do we find those minerals, right? So we see, actually see more concentration in where mineral reserves, known mineral reserves are today than oil, right? Uh, so that means there's, quite frankly, that means we need to do a lot more exploration. Um, exploration does not yet harm the environment, right? Uh, exploration is pretty much just shooting a probe down, uh, down, down, down rock and seeing what is there in terms of ore capacity, right? Um, so we have that uh, choke point on the reserve site. Then when we look at extraction, this is actually quite a, an insane graph if you look at it. Copper here is the least one, right? And we see that the top three countries together have 50% of global uh, extraction of, of copper. This is much bigger, much bigger than oil, okay? So we, we're in a situation where the, the, the geographic concentration of not only of where the resources are, but also of where they are extracted, is really big, right? Um, and that opens you up to, to potential supply chain restrictions and a lot of challenges, right? Um, and then when you move to processing, that cleaning part, you actually see, and this is really key, that there's one country that just quite frankly rules it all, right? And, and that's China. Um, here you see for nickel, oh, that's Indonesia, but most of that is a, a Chinese footprint. Right. Um, most of those are, are companies with, with Chinese technology. It didn't matter whether this was uh, Vatican City. OK, you don't want to see that level of concentration from any country because it opens yourself up to 
geopolitical power plays. It opens yourself up to what if something happens in terms of a climate effect at a port facility, whatever it is. Um, these are not uh, supply chains that are uh, resilient or diversified enough to be, uh, quite frankly, to be fundamentally reliable, right? Um, and so, so China has that. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in 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 a second how they how they got that right. Um, it's even it's even bigger downstream. Let me let me just go here. This is a better way to show it. This is, these are PV modules, right? So you see that in terms of the mining, it's somewhat diversified, even if not really. Material processing, China really comes in as 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 the biggest country, and then the manufacturing part, like the real components, this is where the highest value is at, right? Um, I mean, this is quite. Uh, I'm not sure that that people understand what they're what they're looking at when when you say that. All right, this is China is your your PV factory of the world, right? Um, and and that is a reality that we now urgently need to need to acknowledge. I think if you look at battery cells, it looks very similar, right? Um, where we see a huge present. Uh, presence uh, of China again in the material processing part, but also in the manufacturing um, and assembly uh, part, right? So how did we get there? I think I've got about 10 minutes left. Is that correct? 10, 15 minutes? Yeah. Okay. Perfect. Yeah. How did we get yeah, there? Yeah, 15, 15. Okay. Okay, good. Um, how did we get there? This is where I get sometimes very annoyed, and I'm I'm not going to hide it, right? Um, if you if you open news media, uh, in both US and Europe, you will read that China did not play by the rules. Is that correct? Yes, China has definitely uh, broken a couple of trade rules to get where it is today, but not only, right? And I think it is important to tell that history a little bit more. Uh, you know, with with respect to to Chinese industrial policy as well, which has just been more deliberate, more reliable uh, than the industrial policy in in in, in other countries. Um, that started, of course, in in the nineties, right? I don't know whether you guys know know the smiley curve, but but I like that. This shows the the servicification of 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 uh, economies in in the West, right? In the G seven, so. The West started focusing on R&D and branding and sort of the high value segments, right? And manufacturing, which also includes mineral processing, right? The smelter is a is a dirty thing, right? I mean, it, it, it has chemicals, it, it produces emissions and so forth. They offshored all of that, presuming um, in the 90s, in the 2000s, and already when China, you know, became a member of the WTO, there were, there were serious concerns, but presuming that China would stay here. And that they wouldn't find a way to surf up to R&D, to design, to sales, you know. Um, and I find that that was a very sort of arrogant way to think about uh, global supply chains, right? Um, and what we, of course, have seen is that China has been incredibly successful in moving some of its advantage um, upstream. So meaning with, with mineral extraction um, and processing they have been able to move that step per step downstream, right? And that is not an easy thing to do. Um, as a matter of fact, uh, Carlo, Carlo and Jorge are, are uh, writing a book chapter about, about this, this, uh, this challenge right now. It's a very complicated thing to do, but China managed to do it. Um, and they've done that through different things, through development plans, right? I, I think here I'm going to summarize a little bit, but if for me, if you look at the last, let's say 30 years, what happened is that China had certain development plans that kind of frames its industrial policy, where very early on, as early as basically 2006, they started highlighting um, electric vehicles for us are strategic objectives. In 2011, they said, we need to secure critical mineral uh, supply chains, right? We need to go abroad and invest in those projects. 2011, it took us another decade to understand that importance, right? For them at that point, it was already in a national development plan. Um, and they've taken risks with respect to technology, right? They've been willing, the government has been willing to fund tech development that failed. And there's nothing more important in innovation than financing failure. I cannot emphasize that enough, right? 
in the meantime, what happened, um, yeah, I should also mention the, the Belt and Road Initiative, of course, where you see huge sums spent. Uh, we don't need to go through this, but basically on uh, very early on, right? So starting in 2006, in 2011, it really takes it takes on another dimension when critical minerals were set forth as, as a very strategic need for the economy. Um, and so this is what, what we're basically seeing. This is not, not yet published uh, work here, but... Um, where we're seeing the amount of uh, investment into mining projects um, abroad through the Belt and Road Initiative, right? And we really see basically a decade earlier than we starting to look at it, um, an increasing trend to secure those supply chains, right? And today, if you look at some of the major, this is now uh, an example of lithium, but it, 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 it counts for many other minerals as well. When you look at major merger and acquisition deals or, or specific project financing, a whole lot of that um, is also including um, China, right? You can see that in, 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 in that list. All of this happens, so risk appetite, clear industrial policy, willingness to invest, and yes, also a bit of the breaking of the trade rules. I'm not going to deny that. Um, all of that happened when the, while the US was moving in a different direction. I don't know whether some of you here know Solyndra, but to me, if you ask one, um, you know, if you ask the question, why why is it that the U.S. was unable to uh, to keep pace with with China in terms of tech development? This would be my answer, Solyndra. Um, Solyndra, after the financial crisis in two thousand and eight, received a, a whole lot of money um, from the U.S. government. It was a solar uh, solar panel, a solar manufacturer PV. Um, the com the company went bankrupt, and so a lot of questions were raised about due diligence, risk assessment from the government, and so forth. But most of all, this example was absolutely used and utilized uh, politically, right? So the Democrats were absolutely um, ravaged by, uh, by the Republicans over this failure. Right? And that again comes to that point. You, uh, of course, you need to have good due diligence and of course you need to, um, you need to do, make sure that you have good risk assessment and so forth. But if you don't want to finance failure, you're never going to develop, uh, you know, new products fast enough, right? And what we've seen since then, the Department of Energy has been much more cautious about the type of projects that it funds. And they have been actually fairly successful. The DOE has, has funded very good projects, but projects that were not necessarily anymore linked to, um, yeah, to sort of that... That, that that mineral and battery supply chain, right? And the best example here is A123. So I like to give this example because it comes around the time of Solyndra, right? Around the time of Solyndra, you have this company called A123 who produce a, a new type of battery, um, which is lower in energy density. Um, so it's, it's a bit less attractive for cars, that's true. Um, but it did not use nickel, it did not use cobalt, it did not use uh, manganese. So it didn't use any real critical minerals. They only used uh, lithium, right? And so as a result, it was quite interesting. The government looked at that and they put in some money into the firm. And then when Solyndra happened and unfolded, uh, at one point they said, we're too, you know, this we're not sure where that market is going. We don't want to fund this anymore. Because this was early stage tech development, right? Um, so this was not a, a proven, mature, commercialized technology. Uh, via a few sort of steps, um, the IP ended up in the hands of, of Chinese companies, um, and they further developed that into what is today the lithium iron phosphate battery, which currently has about 40% of global battery cells in the world are lithium iron phosphate, and that share is growing, right? This is a technology that was homegrown in the US and Canada. The way the government was worried about the potential competitiveness and was unwilling to basically help the technology get to market, right? And so if we see that, we realize um, a little bit more, I think, realistically, why are we today um, where we are? Then the question sort of for the, the last bit of my presentation is where do we go from here then, right? Um, and this is where U.S. policy comes in, right? And and I think there's a lot to to say about that. Um, first of all, I think it is very good that a giant like the United States has decided to uh, to wake up. <laughs> I would say the same thing for Europe, and uh, put behind 
uh, or put their fiscal weight behind the energy transition as well, right? And so you had these these different subsidies, 45X, which is a production tax credit, 48C, which is an investment tax credit, and 30D, which is a tax credit for electric vehicles, right? Now, we can say a few things about, about these, and, and maybe I'll, I'll quickly stop with the, with the slides for a second. Um, because when those subsidies are decided on, um, of course, the implementation specifics are not always there yet, right? And I think when we saw that, um, the thing that we saw the most, I'm quickly going to skip here, was this part in the electric vehicle subsidy, right? Which basically said, um, if you if your car wants to be eligible for this type of subsidy, right, you need uh, three conditions. The first one is the car needs to be manufactured in North America, right? Not any single other car can be eligible um, for any part of, of, of these tax credits, right? Secondarily, um, there are local content requirements, right? So the, for battery components, this is how those local content requirements develop, right? So that means that basically by 2029, 100% uh, of the cathode in your battery needs to come from a producer in North America, right? Here, what is interesting, the US did not say the US. The US said North America, right? To make it at least compliant with the uh, US, Mexico, Canada uh, trade deal. For critical minerals, similar thing, but they said it needs to be uh, in free trade agreement countries, right? That, that's where, where the supply needs to come from. Now, I said there's three. The first one, again, was where the battery, was, uh, where the car was constructed. The second one was those local content requirements. The third one was not a single thing can come from foreign entities of concern. That's this requirement right here, right? And that includes China. And so I remember when, when we first saw that, that list and you look at critical minerals and you say um, in 2025, not a single piece of your battery, of your critical minerals used in your battery can come from China. When we saw that, we were like, that's going to be a very difficult one, right? Because um, right now, supply chains are so uh, reliant on, on China, right? And then the question, of course, was, and it's an important question, how is this going to be implemented over time, right? And what we have seen, what we have seen mostly is that it's an election year. So the implementation has, to me, not been that rational. If what you care about truly is balancing domestic industry with energy transition, and I think today the anti-China sentiment and the domestic industry trumps by a lot the energy transition, right? And I'll explain why that is. If you look at the foreign entities of concern requirement, um, they actually came out with a very strict guideline. So how do you how do you know that a mineral is coming from a foreign entities of concern? How do you implement that? Well, the government said. Any company that is more than 25% owned uh, by, by China or a Chinese player is a foreign entity of concern. That is such a strict standard. In the US for sanctions, sanctions, right? For sanctions, they use a benchmark of 50%. For semiconductors, which they link to national security, it was the first real time that they lowered that to 25%, which is basically cutting out most of the supply, um, not just coming from China, but also other countries where there is a Chinese presence in, in projects, right? Um, and they use that same level for, for batteries. And that's basically saying we want China out of here, right? Now, what is interesting is that in the, in the guidance that was recently released, the final rule, they said, but for, for graphite, you get sort of a, you know, I'm not going to go into details, but you get an exception until 2027. Right? Um, and this showed a little bit of, to me, of sort of sensibility about supply chains, because there's no way you can cut out China from the graphite anode part of, of that, right? They're, they're, their dominance is too big and it takes you too long to develop that um, elsewhere, which means that there was a real risk that you have this beautiful tax credit and that absolutely zero models would be able to claim it in the US, which of course is, 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 would be a policy failure, right? At the same time, then what I mentioned today, they hike tariffs on everything, 
right? Um, and so you see a real um, sort of uneasiness um, in, in having that balance between uh, anti-China domestic industry versus versus uh, critical minerals, right? I'm quickly going to to jump here and, and, and say two last words about these other um, subsidies. So 45X, that was your production tax credit, right? Where you could see critical minerals, 10% of your cost of production. Um, we organize a lot of things with the industry, close roundtables to kind of evaluate is are these policies changing the outlook for the domestic industry or not? Um, the answer here is no. Uh, 10% is not enough. Even more, uh, in their proposed guidance on how to implement it, uh, about a month, two months ago, the administration said, and that does not include extraction of minerals. It only includes the processing part, right? Which is interesting because it's basically the administration saying, let's do the extraction elsewhere. That's kind of what it comes down to, right? Um, and and you know what part of that you might some people will say oh we don't like that it's sort of you know neocolonialism with an environmental touch let's do the dirty stuff in different countries rather than the United States that's definitely correct alternatively you could say yes but it's also realizing where your comparative advantage is right? um, now that would be a really good exercise and that's kind of my conclusion here that would be a very good exercise for the United States to do right. China, over a decade and a half, dominated the supply chain. And the US's reaction now, and many countries' reaction, same thing in Europe, is we need to move that back onshore, right? A complete sort of undermining of the, 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 the logic of comparative advantage. That's the first reaction. I think now we're getting into uh, a stage where the US and other countries starting to realize, oh yeah, we are not going to be able to do this alone at all. We're going to need much more international partnerships between different countries, not necessarily only anti-China, because I think that's actually the wrong, it might be politically useful, but I think it's it's a wrong and quite dangerous rhetoric as well. But basically join with different countries because they have different comparative advantages to at least diversify the supply chain. Right? And so now the question is for the next administration, whether that's Biden or Trump, how do you go about that? You know, you could shield away, you could shield completely your domestic market with tariffs, but that's not a good thing for your energy transition. Or you can really try to understand where are different partners' comparative advantages, develop them, and then actually become uh, become competitive um, over over time. I'll stop there because I think I already spoke too long. Um, thank yeah. you, thank you, thank you, thank you very much, Tom. This is this is. Fascinating and scary. Uh, let, let me give the floor to Jorge Valverde. Jorge is a PhD fellow at our institute in, in Maastricht, but he also has a remarkable experience as a policy advisor. He used to work with the Chile Chilean Copper Commission, and he was chief of staff of the Chilean Ministry of Finance, so a lot of uh, policy uh, concrete experience. Jorge, you have uh, 10 minutes. Thank you, Carlo, and thank you a lot, Tom, for your presentation. I think it's, uh, it was pretty insightful about uh, how to understand this, uh, this really hot topic today. Uh, I have uh, three slides that I would like to, to show you uh, because it's, uh, I think that is pretty complementary to what you said. Um, give me one second. So um, the um, well, my my general comment, uh, no, of your presentation about your uh, this topic, uh, I think that you you already took uh, most of them. Um, I mean, I, I divide in general and policy that I think here are the, the main concerns. Uh, something really important, critical minerals for what or for who? This is, is pretty important because that is why we, we can see uh, different lists of critical minerals. And also we see that the, the, this list of critical minerals change uh, between periods, like could be very different between two, um, one decade to, to another one. Uh, then the, the supply disruption risk versus the economic importance. They, they are the, the two main uh, um, uh, criteria that the, the, the countries or uh, continent use. And, and yeah, the, the, the other two points you, you already um, mentioned, it, that I think they're 
these two points are very, very uh, the, the key points. I mean, extraction versus processing, and the physical scarcity versus market constraint. And, and, the, and the best example is the lithium. Lithium is not a scarce uh, mineral. There's a lot of lithium. The, the problem is that the, the, uh, the world cannot, because of many different reasons, uh, exploit of the lithium that is available. Uh, yeah, and the best example is the Uyuni Salar in, in, in Bolivia, right? The, 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 the highest uh, reserve uh, that we have in, in the earth. And then the other part is uh, about policy. Uh, and, and here this demand side versus supply side uh, incentives that are also is very important because most of the uh, most of the time we are thinking this, and I agree that it's very important from the perspective of the technology or the country. So technologies that need this, um, this mineral. But on the other side, as, as you show, uh, a lot of these minerals, the extraction come from um, uh, emerging or uh, poor countries. So they, they also have an, a, a different uh, objective function. They want to maximize the the value that they get from these minerals and in that way that is uh, is uh, of course the the, the incentives are uh, positive because uh, for instance the, the the very good example is uh, again Bolivia with the lithium they they have not exploited because they uh, at, at some point this, they said if we don't produce battery we don't want nothing else and and we have the restriction or the ban of the nickel in Indonesia. That, that at the end is the way as some countries think in this uh, range capture that um, is not uh, it doesn't contribute to the to the challenge of increase the the, the supply of of this mineral. But they are totally uh, fair requests in the sense that okay, how we will benefit from this. Uh, new wave of uh, uh, minerals demand, and the the last the, the last point that I put here that for me is pretty important is, is also that this climate policy uh, are working and um, you you put it in your your slide uh, like uh, shadow subsidies to to other uh, goals like employment investment, uh, and this is also uh, very important because the is. One way to see this is a very na naive way in, in which, okay, this is all about the, the, the mitigation policy, adaptation policy. But at the end, if you see, uh, for instance, the IREA, the subsidy in, in, uh, increase for, for green hydrogen increased five times if you use local employment. So at the end, the most, the most part of this subsidy comes not from the CO2 emission reduction come from the employment share, the, the local employment share. So I, I think that is, and, and I don't know how that will be managed for the World Trade Organization because at, at, at some point uh, is you, you can say, okay, this is the, 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 the way how uh, United States and developed countries are, are replying what China did at some point. But again, there it's like to re respond with that with, with the same point in, in some way so this like general comments and something more specific uh, i want to show two uh, uh graph uh, figures that uh are, are from um one uh, paper that we published uh, with uh, carlo and maria uh, uh maria de las mercedes uh menendez uh, we work um, together in, for the, the UNESCO share, uh, working on this, and it's, 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 it's pretty interesting because what we did here, we, we apply uh, econ um, economic complexity techniques uh, to um, estimate the country's competitiveness producing critical minerals, and at the same time, the level of criticality of these minerals. Uh, what, why I think that it is interesting because it is 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 I um something new is innovative the the methodology. Most of these assessment needs a lot of information and they mix a, a a lot of knowledge. Here we use only export data. Uh, the results are, are are pretty similar that you get uh from I don't know European Commission after four years of war and the results are are not very different. 
And I highlight the the three countries because if if you see here in, in the in the matrix, but also in the, in the table that I put in the right side, uh, the um, under our result in the top five of the most uh, competitive uh, countries to produce these critical minerals that the new technologies need are Russia, United States, and China. So it's a huge geopolitical tension there. Uh, and the other, um, yes, and there's, the other country are South Africa, Australia, Norway, Canada, and Chile. The, the, this is the, 20, uh, the top 20%. And then when we see, um, this is an algorithm that is as, um, basically simultaneously estimate this competitiveness of countries and this result, that is the criticality level of minerals. Um, and here for the minerals, we use uh, different uh, products containing these minerals. So for instance, we have two kinds of lithium, we have carbonate and hydroxide, and that is why we have uh, 46 products um but what is uh what is interesting here is that you can see again that the more critical products are these byproducts uh, most of them are uh, byproduct of uh, platinum uh, pmg group uh and um also rare earth lithium and silicon and and if you look at other other assessment, the, I think that the coincidence is, is, is pretty high. Uh, but this was just using uh, big data and uh, unsupervised uh, algorithm. Uh, and I think that is a um, we think this is a, a, a contribution to do an, a more periodical assessment. We we using less. Uh, information and of course it, it could be improved by uh, adding uh, new or extra information for the demand side of course but uh, you see that only using the supply side because these are based on export you can get uh, pretty I would say uh, accurate uh, information about uh, the criticality uh, level and here in the left side in this graph you, you see the, the gear so you can see how it evolved the criticality of these 46 uh, minerals uh, products contain uh, critical minerals. So yes, this was uh, what I want to show uh, show you because uh, I think that is also pretty complementary uh, regarding what you you presented before. Uh, now I just will give the the, the, the stage to, to to Carlos to Thank open Q and A. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jorge. Uh, we still have a few minutes, so if there's some somebody wants to, well, willing to to ask questions or make comments, uh, this is the time to do it. Let me say that the the, the entire video would be available on the uh, YouTube channel of uh, you and your Merit. So later uh, videos and and PowerPoint will be make will be made available. I don't know whether there's anybody willing to to make a comment or ask something. Uh, uh, Mercedes. Yes. Please. Hi, uh, thanks so much, Tom and Jorge, for your great presentation. I this is this question is uh, basically for both, but um, especially for Tom, and especially in regarding to um, the UNESCO chair is very concerned about Latin America and, and how how important is innovation and so on and so forth. And there is something that always came to my mind when we are talking about these big things and the big problems. Uh, of course, you give a very, very, very accurate picture of nowadays um, the critical minerals and so on. But I was, I was, my point is, I was wondering if you can give some insights in terms of which can be the right way of cooperate, you know, among the producers, for example, in the case of, and this, in the case of Latin American countries that we know that are very rich, and Europe and China. And I mean, if you have any kind of um, insight about that, who, what, what is going to be the, 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 the right or the more uh, convenient way of cooperating in terms of, you know, re reducing inequalities in the con in, in the region and to, to achieve highest GDP, well, all these things. Uh, and I know that it's broad, but I think that it can be very inspiring for our audience. Yeah. I wonder if there's, there's any additional comment. We may group a couple of questions. 
I, I, I would like to ask you, uh, you being experts in, in this specific industry, what is going to, what do you think it, the, 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 will be the role of technological change? I mean, we are, everything is changing all the time. You know, the, the way batteries are produced, uh, the ways uh, uh, different uh, materials are employed uh, and so on. And this might perhaps change the whole picture that we are analyzing and describing at the moment. What, what, what do you think? What, what's your bet on, on, on the future? If there's nothing else, I would uh, ask uh, um, Tom and Harke to reply before we conclude. Sure, maybe, maybe I can give a, a first stab at it, but very keen to hear Jorge's uh, response as well, obviously on the Latin America part, um, for sure. Um, for me, the way I look at it is, uh, is sort of in, 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 in two ways, right? What is, what is China very strong at and what could the US and Europe, quote unquote, counter deliver us as an interesting form of, of partnership. And I think the first thing is, and this is sort of, and I know it will now be on YouTube, but that's fine. But it's the thing that, that we often, or that people often say that, that you know, I sit together which, um, in, in sort of mineral rich countries, which is, if you want the projects done, you call China. If you want the lesson, you call the West. All right, um, that's that's number one. Now, I I don't fully like that part because what the West, I think, can now offer quite interestingly is um, methods, technology as well, expertise to do some of those minerals at a higher uh, social and environmental um, performance, right? But they need to be willing to put in money. And right now, that's just not enough. Uh, and I think that's that's where I'm waiting to see it, to see it you know, level up, right? I mean, we're talking about US and Europe here. Um, there's the mineral security partnership, good start. It doesn't include all, uh, I mean, it doesn't include some key members, I would say in Latin America, but also other mineral rich countries as members. I think that's something that could be taught about. The Development Finance Corporation, every single conversation that we have in the US is, oh, they need to get much more active. They've done one single investment, 50 million in TechMet which is sort of a company that operates as an investor itself into some of those projects. That's it. That's insufficient, right? Um, I think what happened over time, same thing for the World Bank, we've gotten very good, quote unquote, very good, but um, in Western countries to support projects much more downstream, the installation of solar PV, the installation of renewables and so forth. And we're not very good or because we're not very experienced at it in working on extractives specifically. Right, and in putting money there and in guiding projects there. And I think that's something that we need to urgently uh, you know, start to learn by doing, so actually try out projects and so forth. And I would add a second point to that, which is um, really appreciating the strategic goals of the mineral rich countries here as well. And that includes value addition, yes, but also general revenue stabilization, economic development. Because right now we're seeing that what China really cares about is batteries and electric vehicles. They play, obviously, in mineral-rich countries to get their access on the minerals needed to power those industries, right? And we have seen in several examples that they are willing to offer something in return. Processing capacity, for example. Training programs. All of the things that we know are actually good for economic development. The West, you know, Europe and the US, you asked, I think need to jump on that quite uh, quite quickly as well, right? Uh, and move away from the, we're going to onshore everything to, okay, that's what I mean with, let's, let's seriously think again about comparative advantage and see where people's uh, strategic goals uh, fit there, right? Um, so then on that side, I think, uh, Carlos, your, uh, you, your question is very interesting. Um, the, the first thing that I would say is that technologies change super fast, but also sometimes not as fast as people think. Um, you, you know, I, every day I will read that solid state batteries are going to be commercially available in every single electric vehicle in the next two or three years. That's just not how it works, right? It's, it is a bit longer than that. Um, that being said, we used to think about this in terms of decades. Now, indeed, we can think about it in terms of uh, in terms of years, um, and things will happen very, very quickly there. And this is where, where yeah, things are starting to get complex, right? Because normally when you invest in R&D, there is the idea we invest in R&D, and as a result, we're going to improve the product and reduce the cost of that product, right? 
So when countries in Europe or in the US are now thinking we're going to do that with batteries, yes, but China is doing the exact same thing and they're doing it faster at lower costs and higher quality. So there, what I am, what I think we're moving towards, and I'm not very comfortable with that from, again, a climate change and energy transition standpoint, is that markets are going to start you know, really pulling away from, from each other. And we're going to start blocking uh, Chinese exports, uh, even though they're the good quality and lower cost to protect domestic industries. And I think it is a, a, a standard uh, reflex, um, but it's one that's going to happen only more because that, that sort of fallacy of thinking we invest in R and D and we will lower the product prices is, 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 is going to, uh, going to, to show um, there's one other constraint in the technology side that I think people often overlook, which is equipment. Um, the manufacturing equipment is something that we don't look at, you know, nearly enough. Uh, a lot of that is in Chinese hands. There's other very good equipment, South Korea and Japan specifically on the battery side of things. Um, but that will become a, a bottleneck as well. Um, um, yeah, maybe I'll quickly stop there and and, and curious to hear for his uh, points as well. Jorge, please, please go ahead. We're running short of time, but please take your time and respond. Sure. Yeah, uh, regarding Mercedes' point, I think that the, the region has one opportunity based on the diversity of minerals that we have. Uh, and I'm thinking not go, I don't know, until the final product, but I'm thinking, for instance, now one Chinese company, and here I go to the point that uh, this difference between Chinese company and European or you know, or American companies, that when they go, there's one company that now they are producing uh, lithium cathode in Chile. Uh, that is the up the, the upgrade from the from what we have. That is the carbonate and hydroxide. And so one of the condition of that investment to get the lithium was to go there. But they, they, they went there because we have all the minerals that they, they need for that specific kind of uh, lithium cathode. But then if you think uh, in, um, in other kind that needs a, a wide, wider variety of, of minerals, I think that if you combine the, 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 the endowment of the different countries, maybe you can. Uh, but you need, uh, of course, uh, foreign technologies. Uh, there's not, I don't have doubts about that. Uh, I mean, in the case of uh, lithium for solar, I think that the Chile has the technology as a SQM, they have a really good, tech, they, they know how to do it. But for instance, in Australia, that they, they want to start to produce, produce hydroxide and they don't know it. And uh, at the end, they, they what they are doing is doing like a joint venture with the Chinese company they already know. So, yeah. Technology plays here uh, a, a big role. Uh, so, and I think that, yes, with this uh, also, I, I reply part of uh, what Carlos said. I think the ask, I think that the China has, uh, they they build on technology advantage that is huge, at least related with the, with the uh, electric vehicle and the supply chain there. Uh, and they have been really success to reduce price cost. And um, for me, it's a, really a, a threat that the, the, the rest of the, the, the world, uh, the West countries start to this fight of uh, commercial fight of tariffs. So yeah, I'm not really optimistic in that way. Thank you very much. Uh, I don't see any other questions, but let me thank uh, Tom Mollenhut for having been with us. Very happy he could share his ideas and his new research uh, results, uh, as well as Jorge Valverde for his comments. And let me conclude with uh, with an announcement. Uh, uh, next week, we have uh, another uh, interesting webinar on, on Tuesday, May the 21st at 3 p.m. Uh, European time. We'll, we're will we going to have uh, uh, Rodrigo Valdez, Valdez, who's the IMF director of the Western Hemisphere that will be talking about the role of micro macro finance and the climate change, and and our colleague uh, Professor Anthony Barsocas uh, will be the discuss something commentator. So next week, uh, uh, May twenty first. Thank you again. Uh, goodbye and see you soon. Bye bye.